introduction, yes, I'm, I'm John from, I've uh, uh, been working for the last few months in Google AI in Ghana, as we, we get that started up, and also in McCary University, so I'm split, split appointment. And uh, I want to talk about <coughs> satellite imagery, and this ties in quite well with a few things people have been discussing in, in this meeting. Uh, Elaine was talking earlier about building density and why that could be useful. Uh, we heard from the Global Partnership uh, on the um, sustainable development data about the uses of satellites, and so I wanted to go into that. Um, so where I wanted to start with this was, um, I've been working on satellite for a year or two now, and um, previously to Google doing this inside the UN Global Pulse, which we heard a bit from yesterday. Um, and where this began was uh, refugee settlement mapping. So this is an image of uh, a map of a refugee settlement in South Sudan, and it's been mapped out by this unit called UNISAT, which is the UN's operational satellite applications track, I think. And uh, what they do is uh, request satellite imagery of emergency sites or refugee settlements or conflict zones or that sort of thing, and uh, for um, make these maps for humanitarian purposes, and they do it manually. So they have a room full of people who know all about the physics of satellites and remote sensing and uh, experienced <coughs> humanitarian situations on, on the ground and how to interpret these satellite images. And uh, they uh, go um, building by building in a, in, in a large area and digitize each one quick, 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 um, with the type of building and so on. And it results in these maps and uh, it's a really high quality product, you know, very, very uh, expert, labor intensive work. They try to get them out pretty fast, it takes a few days. Uh, and there might be order of tens of thousands of, of points in each of these. So, you know, a request comes in and they, they usually uh, are able to task satellite imagery and click these things out and re release the shape files publicly within, within a few days. Um, so, uh, we came to this through while I was working in Global Pulse. This was a kind of um, internal data science consultancy, effectively. Like we would we would receive requests for uh, for things to be automated, uh, and this seems like a good candidate for this. Like it's a quite a repetitive task. There's lots and lots of data available. Unisat put all their stuff online, so you can see uh, like literally millions of things that they've clicked on over the years. Uh, and each task is quite homogenous. Each of the, the between tasks might be quite different. Uh, you know, every settlement is different, the terrain and, and the type of structures and all of that, but within a task, it's kind of consistent. So it's all great. Um, so we spent some time training object detection for this. And so these are examples of tents in, in, uh, in South Sudan. And uh, I'm gonna try and, um, uh, I think this might not be focused very well. Okay, I don't think I can multitask to that extent. Sorry, you'll have to put up with it being a bit blurry. Um, so these are uh, these are mostly tent shelters, and we spent some time training uh, object detection to do uh, this kind of thing to recognise like where there were tent, um, so that we could automate the mapping, and from that they would have this number of households in the settlement, and they would know what provisions are needed, how much medicine, food, shelter, and so on. Um, and so it, we had this experience that it worked uh, okay. Um, not quite well enough to put into actual use immediately, and I'll tell you a bit about that story, uh, where we got up to with that, and then, uh, and then I'd like to just sort of give you a, a, a feel for what's going on at the moment um, with work in, in Google on satellite, where we sort of took this on to the next level. So, uh, example of detection here, and this is detection with uh, mask RCNN. So, uh, we've got this type of model which. Um, uh, tries to locate a bounding box around each object and then within that bounding box fills in the pixels which we allocate to that to that object. So as a result we get this this instant segmentation. Like for each tent is the type of object we're trying to recognize here, then we have the, the pixels for, for each one. So we can count the number and for each one we can see how big it is and exactly its shape. Here's a example of a of another. So it's kind of, you know, not bad. Uh, uh, does, does roughly the right thing. Um, this was the data that we were dealing with uh, back then. So there were, I think, 13, uh, 13 settlements, some of them grayscale, um, some of them RGB images, ranging in size from, uh, from quite small ones of, uh, you know, half a, 
half a square kilometre up to you know, 30 square kilometres, some of the, these high Sudan ones were, were quite big areas. Uh, and there was roughly 80,000 structures or so on. So this was our, our data set um, and that we were <coughs> trying to get this, this working on, so we'd cross-validate on, on this. Um, the data that we received from this came in points, so the Unisat people, they don't really care about exactly the extent of each, each uh, shelter, so they clicked on points, and we had to make them into polygons uh, in Kampala, so we spent, which actually isn't all that much, much work, so uh, one, one lesson from this is don't be afraid of like, digitizing your own labeled data sets for image stuff, it's actually you know, it's kind of a pain, but you, know, you can employ students and so on, and then, you know, a few people for a few weeks can actually make some really nice uh, uh, label data sets um, if you have the imagery. So that's the data we worked <coughs> on and with this um, we tried like a leave one settlement out evaluation to see like how good would our results be on each settlement if we uh, trained on all of the other settlements. So this would simulate this situation where like there's a new situation, the ta satellite imagery has been tasked, we run our recognizer on it, you know, how good is it? And um, here's some precision recall curves. Uh, which, you know, are kind of all right. It's not not working, but uh, it's not really good enough. Um, so, you know, maybe we wanted to see things in, we, we needed an operating point like in this upper right square where both precision and recall are above 0.9. Um, actually, precision really, they wanted it above 0.95 uh, because deleting things is more work than adding them in. So they were like, we can take a hit on recall as long as precision is very high, like 95% or above. Uh, and we weren't really getting, getting close to that um, at all, even though, interestingly, visually, as you saw the results back there, like kind of look not bad, but um, uh, like visual examples can be quite misleading, I guess. You know, you, the, the eye doesn't pick out the things which weren't, which weren't detected. <coughs> so what we did was come up with this semi-automated system, which is actually in, in use now. This is, um, this is now in production. So um, what we do is we have some training of what we'd call a base net. And so this is like a general purpose structure detector for refugee settlements. So we take all our training data we've got and we train our base net and it's a, a mask RCNN model. So what we can do is take imagery from uh, some new camp, some new settlement, you know, the, the satellite is tasked, it flies over, it sends back the image. You run that image through the, the thing that you've already trained and you've kind of got ready and uh, you get some detections. And the detections are like kind of okay, but not really sort of good enough to put out there. You know, you wouldn't want to, these aren't good enough quality to make um, humanitarian decisions on the basis of. So what happens next is we would have the experts in Unisat label part of the, the camp. So maybe they do like 10% or something. Uh, and this would be like an extra bit of adaptation data, especially for that. And the reasoning was that within settlements, it's fairly homogenous. Uh, and once you've seen a few tents or shelters of different types in one, one camp, then you can kind of guess what all the others look like based on that. So we'd have some, um, uh, some expert an adaptation that would give us an adapted network. And then, uh, okay, it's getting a bit filled up with boxes and stuff here, but we'd get like an augmented detection, which was higher quality. Um, so, and that can be a loop, right? So we can see uh, the, the people who've done this extra annotation can then see what that looks like and they can judge if it's good enough. And at some point they're like, okay, yeah, we've, we've trained this enough and uh, it's good to go. So, you know, predict and let me download the shape file. So that is, uh, so that's working now. They've been using this bit in, in Syria. Um, and so what that looks like is like, here's some imagery uh, and Here's uh, a detection, which I showed you an example of before. And here's like when you do the augmented net, you find a bunch of other stuff, which are sort of a, uh, yeah. So um, another example here, base net, and then we find the missing ones uh, with the augmented net. So that's um, basically where we got to with that. And uh, I think what, what was interesting to me was seeing the the possibilities of doing things with satellite data, I mean, it's a great resource, as we uh, have difficulty with various types of data sets, uh, there's, you know, you have, to, um, you have to either collect it physically with sensors, or it's like data that you have to get from some, you know, organization or something, and satellite data is amazing, like you can get it from any point on the globe, it transcends national boundaries, uh, you know, it's just, 
uh, a really nice data source with lots of interesting stuff <coughs> in it. Uh, and when we were doing this project with these particular places, I think we hit the limits of the data that we had available then. So, um, you know, there was just, uh, we had like these 13 different regions, which isn't really all that much variation in, in types of terrain and all of that. So um, this got me thinking, like, what could happen at a larger scale? Could we train a general purpose structure detector and be able to detect interesting things like that? So humanitarian applications are one, but there's all sorts of other stuff, right? To do any kind of economic mapping to look at, like, where are populations and what do they need, or, uh, like, approximating census data when censuses are out of date or unreliable. Uh, like maybe information about where buildings are, just as one example, perhaps that can tell you all sorts of useful stuff, uh, which might be like a rich source of information, as we've been hearing from people already uh, today and yesterday. So what's going on now? Um, there's some work in our office in Google Ghana. Uh, Andrea Brome is helping out with this, uh, and a couple other people internally within, within Google. And uh, we're looking at applying a sort of larger scale training and evaluation set to this to see how far we can go with general purpose building detection uh, within Africa. So we've gone from about the 80,000 or so labeled polygons up to, up to the millions, so one and a half million polygons for Africa and we have another couple of them. Um, places where buildings have similar characteristics like uh, Latin America and bits of, bits of Asia. Uh, and so our training data is much the same as we had before, where like there's some imagery and we have both bounding boxes and then within within each bounding box a, uh, a, a polygon. Um, sometimes a, multiple buildings are kind of joined together, which is uh, uh, slightly inconvenient. Uh, and what we're trying this time is learning not an object detection model yet, but uh, a segmentation model first. Um, so thinking, you know, as we know our context here, sometimes it's pretty difficult to segment individual buildings, uh, very high density areas in, in cities. You know, if you uh, go to the, the, the slum areas and roofs are right next to each other, then uh, how does a model say that this is one building, this is another building? And sometimes it's really not clear. So segmentation models, here are some examples uh, visually. So this is uh, <coughs> Deep Lab, the Deep Lab segmentation model with um, exception uh, as the, the feature extracting uh, that burn. And we take some images and we can seemingly, with the data we have at the moment, do a pretty good job of, of segmenting this. Uh, so uh, these are kind of urban areas where uh, these, are, these are quite tricky things for object detectors. Like I, I don't believe this image on the bottom left you could really do very well with a, a Pastor RCNN or a Mask RCNN type thing because everything's right next to each other and that's a a case where those models tend not to work very well, but segmentation may be followed by extracting some statistics or working out if there are separate buildings might, might work better. A couple more examples there. Okay, so it does reasonably well in terms of, uh, in terms of accuracy. One of the first things that we're looking at is being able to quantify the density of, of roofing at, uh, at a fine spatial scale. So are there, um, uh, are there statistics we can extract about how, how much of each place is covered by roof? You know, and that, um, uh, I think there's more to, to go, but that's already an interesting statistic. If we can get this at large scale, you know, that might be useful for people to use for a number of, a number of things. Uh, so, you know, so a correlation between what's the true roof density up to 100%. 100% is pretty, that's quite a lot of roof. Uh, you know, we're dealing with, um, uh, we're dealing with image tiles here, which are like five, 12 pixels. That's like a 250 meter square on the ground. Uh, so it's unsurprising there's a few up to the 100% 100, uh, 100 covered in roof. So that's, that's pretty dense. Um, uh, but anyway, reasonable, reasonable kind of correlation there. Uh, so that's stuff that's going on at the moment. And uh, where hopefully, the, the I'll just kind of mention the the plans next, uh, uh, particularly if anyone's interested in um, you know, collaborating this stuff, I think they're interested in finding example applications of this. The first thing we have planned is uh, in Kampala, Kamocha is a high density area in Kampala, uh, and working with Pulsar Kampala and the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, and the plan here, which we're still kind of getting together, is that Bureau of Statistics is surveying this on the ground, so they have uh, 
um, uh, a survey which is geo-referenced so they can have like household level you know how many households are there uh, and then this hypothesis that we'd like to try out is uh, uh, if you run a segmentation network on satellite imagery which they've also tasked they have imagery corresponding to the time of the survey uh, how good does the, the neural net predict the, the measurements from the ground and if it if it does okay then this might be an interesting way of quantifying slum development across the world which is an increasing problem uh, something uh, something very important the way cities are composed and the way they expand uh, so you know if this could become a, a, a standard practice for the way people quantify slums that could be that could be pretty useful um, more generally um, let's have a look at some of the other so this isn't the only type of building data, right? There's actually a fair number of sources available which can do this kind of thing. And I thought some people might be interested to know instead that it's kind of good to go right now. Uh, so one of the standard things people look at is an index called normalized difference built up index. And um, uh, this relies on the fact that buildings tend to reflect certain types of light more than other types of light. So there's a more famous uh, remote sensing product, normalized difference vegetation index which basically says plants reflect lots of green and lots of near-infrared, but very little uh, uh, red. They tend to absorb that. So, um, uh, so there's a, an index which just takes the, the different bands and you know, there's some like, equation which you, you go from remote sensing images to how much vegetation there is. So built-up index is really similar to that. So this is Kampala, and we can kind of see built-up areas. Uh, so this is derived from Landsat data, which I think is like 30 meter resolution. So that's already pretty cool. Uh, and it's actually not bad, like this NDBI for a bunch of stuff. Um, the only thing is this calibration, like so, uh, okay, so for the Ugandans, we're gonna go west along Ginger Road, past Makono. Uh, here's the, uh, here I think are some sugarcane plantations, right? Which are also kind of coming up to the thumb. Sort of glitch. It's a really simple sort of index. So there are some things in the natural environment which also trigger this high values in, in this index. So this, these these aren't buildings. These are um, these are cultivated land of some sort. Um, so interesting data source, freely available worldwide. You can choose any thirty meter square on the planet you like, and uh, you know get get what the building index is. But um, you maybe have to do a bit of handholding of that that type of data to make sure it really is buildings and it's not being kind of triggered by, uh, by something else. Um, there's a cool data set which Facebook released as well, and I'll show you that. So uh, what um, Facebook's connectivity lab did um, is try to classify, also on high resolution satellite imagery, so this is going back to the types of images that I showed you before, and taking uh, quite small squares. I think they're like 100 meters, they're like one arc second, or which I think is about 100 meters squares on the ground, and classifying each square as containing buildings or not containing buildings. Binary classification. And this is what you can see here. So uh, you, know, you can kind of zoom in and see for each square, like does it have buildings or does it not have buildings? Uh, and so they have, you can get this data from the raw classification and what they were really wanting to use it for was construct population maps. So they also take census data and they use that to, they, they use these, uh, these like building, not building uh, classifications with the census data to then try and like put a number in each square of like how much, um, uh, how many people are in each, in each place. So this is, this, is, um, this is also a very interesting data set. Uh, so I think they did this for like 33 African countries, as I understand. I, um, uh, all, all I know is what I've read online, so you can also check that out. But in case you weren't aware, this is pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Like when you look at the imagery, um, I'm not online here now, so I don't know what tiles I've got cached. Let me see. Okay, that's probably uh, that's probably fruitless. So it's um, it's it's not bad. Like it, it seems to correspond like fairly well. Not really not really perfectly, and it's at this binary level, uh, but like I, I think you'll agree this is a pretty interesting research resource. So, uh, um, uh, so these are the kind of things going on. So back to where we fit into this. Um, uh, one thing, this project's still sort of evolving and um, uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what goes on, but I think there's a couple of things which are useful. One is like being able to 
to a general purpose building detection is pretty useful, I think. There's, there's these situations where you really need to know exactly the outline of, of buildings, like in these humanitarian situations and, and things like that. So you know, hopefully that's one contribution. Um, the idea with this work, like if we are able to open source things, and that's, that's pretty cool as well, because pre-training can be quite helpful for other people's tasks where they have fewer satellite, uh, you know, fewer training data to, to play with. So um, hopefully having something trained on lots of data, even if for licensing, you know, Google has to like buy the satellite imagery off the providers and aren't licensed to sort of provide the data directly, you know, you have to sort of go back to the original owner of that, that data, the digital globes and so on. But by providing something pre-trained on lots of data, meaning this like hopefully could open up access for people who have like limited amounts and it's not really enough to get a very high quality model working with the amount of data they have if they're training from scratch or training from a model like pre-processed, pre-trained with ImageNet or something, but maybe something pre-trained with satellite with your few examples of whatever it is you're looking at or you know, maybe you're counting cars or you're counting, um, um, uh, you know, like you're trying to do like flooding analysis and segment flooded areas or something like that. You know, maybe, uh, maybe we can provide some resources uh, which people can use for that. So this is all in motion, uh, you know, hopefully uh, by next Data Science Africa, which is a few months away, uh, we'll have more to say on that. Uh, but just to let you know what's going on uh, and that we're very interested in hearing about like potential uses of this, because uh, I guess the more that the community finds these things useful, then you know, the, better, uh, the better case we have to, uh, to, uh, to press on with it. Uh, so, um, in summary, I mean, like just looking at this continentally, look at this worldwide, but um, thinking what's going on uh, within Africa, you know, if you imagine all the data which exists for this stuff, uh, uh, 50 centimeter imagery, even as compressed JPEG imagery, I mean, it's like three or 400 terabytes of, of imagery. There's like so much stuff going on in there that we can discover. Um, the, it's always a bit tricky getting hold of this, but it's not like, it's not super expensive if you have to do projects which are uh, on some kind of limited, you know, if you have like tens of square kilometers, for example, as your study area, then that's really not much to just kind of get the, to, to actually just call up Digital Globe and, you know, specify your area and you can, you can, just, uh, you can just buy it. Um, hopefully access to this kind of data is opening up in general. There's lots more satellites going up, lots of innovation in the types of satellites, so I'm <coughs> optimistic that this you know, type of data will become uh, more useful and then combining that with uh, models which we, uh, we try to move forward with, uh, then I think we should be able to find out lots of, lots of pretty interesting information here for a range of applications. Okay, I'll uh, leave it there. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, if you have any questions, No, 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 we didn't, uh, yeah, we've not tried that so far. Um, most of the stuff we've been doing, we kind of reused some existing data that had already been labeled and people didn't seem to be doing much with. Uh, but yeah, no, as labeling comes up, uh, that seems like a good idea. I guess you have to be careful for the fact that your model might confidently get things wrong. Yeah. You know, so perhaps it involves getting to some stage with your model that you're pretty sure it's so I guess for it to have well calibrated probability, certain estimates as we were discussing before, you know, to get to that stage of calibrability, calibration, it might be already quite a well-trained model. If those uncertainties are reliable, then maybe it's, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, you see what I mean. Um, uh, but I think it's interesting though, nonetheless. I mean, there is just kind of common sense looking at it. A lot of stuff looks like other stuff that you've already labeled. So why bother labeling, you know, a thousand houses that all look identical? I mean. 
there's probably more interesting stuff. So it's a great point, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. So, um, I wanted to ask as always. I can't, I can't see where you are. Oh, there you are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Disembodied voice talking. <laughs> can everyone else hear that? <laughs> <laughs> so, when in, so, getting information from Slam or I highly grab from a very many. We have situations where houses are very close to each other. And um, how do you make your model? Uh, identify each individual house without having instances where maybe it, it assumes maybe one household because close to another is the same household. And then secondly, with the data you talked about, does it come in already annotated, maybe in this common password block format, or I have to get this data from the satellite imagery and then manually annotate uh, the regions and then train my model? Thank you. Um. Yes, one high density. Yeah, if you think of slums, it's really difficult to say that this is one building or this is another building. So that's part of the, the thinking behind the segmentation approach, doing segmentation first. So um, like faster RCNN, mask RCNN rely on first finding bounding boxes around an object and then filling in where it is, which like uh, in a slum just doesn't really make sense because it's kind of a map. So with the segmentation model, what you can do is say within this area, how many square meters of roof are there? Uh, and then maybe we'll see how this goes goes down with the, uh, the the Uganda stuff. I think it's going to be really inter interesting to see what the the Polestar Kampala Uganda Bureau of Statistics things come up with because they've got satellite imagery doing a survey on the ground, and I think they'll be able to from that derive things like what's the average number of square meters of roof per household, uh, and that changes from place to place. But maybe they'll have some information which can put some some light on that. Uh, but yeah, like I think counting individual buildings in a place where it's just corrugated like it's just metal roofs you know it's gonna uh it's probably not not very um uh you know might not be the right approach uh yeah data formats um uh like f for training a segmentation model basically what you need is like the image and a segmentation mask so essentially you're training with two 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 images one where like the pixels represent a, a class um in this case, so if it was object detection, then that's a bit different. You know, you have a list of objects and their 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 coordinates of, of each one. So this just depends a bit on which type of uh, type of model you're training. Yeah. Okay, this time I'm going to take from Brady. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay, I don't see any one. Okay, let's keep the lady. <laughs> <laughs> thing you could think about is planning like n at a national planning level you know where do people live uh, is often there's kind of scarce data on that you know like uh, censuses might take a long time and you know might not have all the details uh, so I think with building densities then you can know uh, what's the demand for public services for example like if you don't have accurate information about where settlements are then it's quite difficult to provision uh, the right amount of, of, uh, of service. Um, uh, I'm pretty interested in like quantifying things, so uh, I think like proxies for population density are really interesting to me. Um, uh, there was a great summary yesterday from uh, Victor. Is Victor still around? GPS TV? Um, I guess. Ray, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Victor, if you have something to chip in, then please, uh, awesome. please feel free. But I think you gave a a range of things where you know satellites yeah. might extract interesting statistics. Yeah. I was going to ask you some questions. Oh, great! You can you can help me answer that question and then uh, ask <laughs> your questions. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I came in late, late, and maybe you can get the question. But my question to you is, uh, um, I, I guess the model can be applied to a certain you know sectors or or perhaps some certain sector issues. For instance, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sorry. in terms of using that model for poverty, you know, profiling, or maybe looking at the 
Commission runs up to use the protective gear to have fun. Uh, we usually so saw around what sort of you know, our validation method is used. And in fact, can get the question to the Public Health Council to point it out to the Commission. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, sorry, which was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> Application of the model. Um, uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, a number of countries in Africa are trying to do poverty profiling. Right, right. Can we use that model to do poverty profiling using looking at you know, new sites, so to speak, and how these sites are blocked? Yeah, 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 thanks. Okay, it's coming, coming back to me now. Yeah. Um, uh, so. I think there's lots of information that comes out about like how, how large roofs are or how they're concentrated together, that kind of thing. Um, so there's someone else in our office, Nyalang Morosi, who's been interested in the patterns uh, like spatial inequality. You know, there are some places where you see lots of buildings packed together and then, you know, large buildings with lots of space around them. And I think there's some pretty interesting stuff to be said about that. So, uh, so that's something that, that Nyalang's been um, looking into and I think that's that's an interesting uh, point of view uh, yeah I mean the roofing type that certainly I mean I guess the, the where this links in with measurements of prosperity or poverty in household surveys this is a commonly captured thing by enumerators like which is the which is the roof type of a um, of a you know is it thatched or metal roofed or, or tiled uh, and to some extent you can classify that from from the satellite imagery so uh, that's quite nice because it ties in with all this ground data. You know, we know the relationship between roofing type and the well-being or the circumstances of a household within that. You know, statistically, there's some link between those two, which is kind of understood by the develop development economists and, and all that. Uh, so if we can measure that thing, which is a proxy from satellite imagery, and then we understand the link from that to well-being issues, then that seems seems like a uh, there could be some potential there. Yeah. So I think um, the nice thing, like. From my perspective, what I would love to do is just get some models out which do building uh, detection and then have people like adapt them and to those kinds of purposes. I think that would be nice. Um, so yeah, about the types of data. So the Landsat thing was a comparison. The, that was the built-up index at 30 meter resolution. So what we're using is 50 centimeter imagery. And it comes from a bunch of sources. So it's mostly digital globe, there's some Airbus data. Whatever you see on Google Maps Satellite View, that's what we're using, uh, essentially. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah. So the stuff. So all the things that, that we're doing, which I was talking about, is fifty centimeter. Yeah. Uh, so the thirty centimeter is like uh, the a comparison I was showing of other data, which is uh, which is freely available at the moment. Not not from not from not because of our work. This is uh, like Landsat imagery. Um, but yeah, thirty meter resolution. I mean, still uh, this. So you still can get this measure of building density. It's got some caveats, uh, but. You know, it can be used for a bunch of stuff, and I, I, I actually think there's a lot of applications from that 30 meter uh, or 10 meter. I mean, you can, you know, of the freely available stuff like Sentinel uh, um, and those kinds of sources. There's actually a fair bit I think that is possible to do with that, um, which maybe you know the the juice hasn't quite been like squeezed out of all that data uh, so far, and it's timely as well, right? That stuff it comes every every two weeks or every 10 days, whereas 50 centimeter you've got to task it, you have to buy it, uh, like as as one off. So thanks for the question. Okay, I will take one and maybe. Okay, I will take this I guess, yeah, that's interesting, small medium enterprises. So I guess my question would be, like, if you were flying into a plane and landing over some area, could you tell by looking at some place whether it was a, a small or medium enterprise or if it was a house or, yeah, tricky. Like, I don't know, yeah. I mean, if there were any features that, like, might, yeah. that were distinctive for that then, or, the, like, could it be... I mean, you can kind of tell industrial buildings, you know, some things like a warehouse or a factory, you can probably tell that by the, but the SMEs, I don't know. 
I suppose they might go on in people's houses. Uh, so uh, I, I think which is which is a great point because it shows the kind of limitation of this sort of sort of analysis. You know, you can get lots of interesting stuff from looking down from the from the top, but then you, you know you see a roof, but you've got no idea what's going on inside that roof, right? You don't know if it's empty or if it's a business or if it's a, a house or or whatnot. So um, you know, this definitely is a piece of the the data puzzle, but you know, you can't. You, there's lots of stuff that you you can't tell. You hit some limitations. Yeah, yeah. So OpenStreetMap do some cool stuff, actually. Yeah, I mean, apart from people who volunteer to just do, do, uh, do streets, and there is a bunch of that. Uh, there's also humanitarian OpenStreetMap where people map other people's streets, you know, from from the, from the images. Um, to make use of this for training data, uh, this poses a pretty interesting vision problem, um, which is, to train a model, you really need to know where that thing was, where each object was, each building on the image that you're looking at. And the thing about satellite data is each time it's like a bit, it's a bit different because the satellites come in and they look at it at different angles uh, or there's different lighting conditions or uh, like there's this uh, orthorectification thing. So like the satellite doesn't really know about like the hill shape. So they have to try to correct for that and it gets corrected in different ways. And as a result, uh, when you get hold of the open street map imagery and you overlay it on whichever satellite data you happen to have, it's quite often shifted by like 20 pixels this way or 10 pixels that way or something. Um, so I think it could possibly be used and this would be a pretty interesting thing to think about. But to train, you would have to have something which learned to align those things first of all uh, and then fit, the, fit your model to the aligned, the aligned thing. So, but I, I, I've never heard of um, like anyone sort of tackling this problem, but it might be quite an interesting uh, uh, little project for someone. You know, take, um, take a misaligned, training data but misaligned in some consistent way uh, and try to train to images where everything's like offset in some way or there's some like affine like <coughs> uh, you know distortion of the, the training labels. Uh, so long story short open street map is pretty cool but it's uh, there's some challenges with using it for training data. Last question from me. Hey John, so uh, first of all thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is um, actually similar to Victor's so in Ghana, I'm quite familiar with the issue of the electricity corporation complaining that uh, one of the issues is that you know they're not not every utility user is uh, actually on the electricity grid or registered houses. And so I was wondering if uh, you know the model you're suggesting could you know be uh, could be used to help uh, address this issue of you know unregistered uh, utility users and you know being able to label them. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, so um, uh, like nighttime light interest data is pretty pretty cool for this. Also freely available, so that's great stuff to look at. Um, um, so if you measure, uh, I think that uh, I don't know what kind of resolution you get, but you might be able to pinpoint uh, um, fairly fairly small areas with that, and just seeing which areas are like lit up where they weren't connected to the to the grid. Uh, could be pretty interesting, yeah. Um, there was one related thing that we were chatting about a while ago in um, in Uganda, where we had at one point we this was back when I was doing UN work, and we had some work with the water utility in Kampala, and they had they had GPS locations of each of their their water points, like the the termination points at the properties, at residences, or or businesses, and uh, which category of user they were, like residential or industrial and um, they had this issue with industrial users claiming to be residences because it's like a lower rate they would pay less for the for the water and so we were thinking like one one idea for a, a project maybe someone's interested in doing this would be to take uh, take a satellite uh, view of that uh, of that area uh, and tr 
train a classifier based on industrial or residential, and then look for outliers. You know, you could see some property which the um, which the classifier strongly believes to be industrial, but it's listed as residential. You know, maybe you could have a look at that, and perhaps indeed it's like a factory that's. Uh, you know, you, you might sort of pick up some of those. Anyway, just a sort of fun idea that we discussed, but maybe there's applications there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. John.